Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled 20th Century Fiction where we're looking at Virginia Woolf's novel Mrs. Dalloway. So we're beginning to wind up this novel and in this section we will look at uh, some of the representations of medical masculinities in this novel. By medical masculinity of course I mean the two uh, medical doctors, the two doctors uh, Holmes and Bradshaw in the novel who obviously are tyrannical doctors who exhibit no empathy, who exhibit no kindness to the patients and uh, instead they talk about preparation, they talk about health, they talk about uh, you know, hygiene in a very eugenics uh, centric kind of a way. Right? So, and obviously the entire gaze that they have is very, very masculinist, uh, is very, very tyrannically masculinist. Right? So that obviously doesn't have any degree of uh, empathy in it and is hyper rationalist as well. So this typical construction of masculinity as being something informed by rationality, reason, logic, proportions, etc. is what informs in turn their medical gaze as well. Okay, uh, and we also see how the Big Ben in a novel is interesting because the Big Ben is obviously the big clock in London, the tower clock in London, and it's it's an example of you know standard clock time, right? It's a time which is the same for everyone, but the Big Ben, uh, you know, uh, banging away, uh, you, know, st you know, striking out sounds, chiming out the sounds. Uh, it has a very symbolic significance in this novel because that obviously uh, is something which connects all the different characters across the metropolis. So in that sense, uh, it's a bit of a hyperlink novel where every narrative is linked to every other narrative in very complex ways. But the Big Ben seems to be this very, uh, this, this echo of time, this echo of standard clock time, which is spreading across the different narratives uh, um, that the story is exhibiting. Okay. Uh, so the Big Ben becomes a very symbolic uh, presence in this novel as being this overarching presence of clock time which runs the metropolis against which we have different kinds of micro times, different experiences of micro time uh, embodied and exhibited by these human characters, the human figures uh, in this landscape. So it was precisely 12 o'clock, and this should be on the screen, it was precisely 12 o'clock, 12 by Big Ben, whose stroke was wafted over the northern part of London, blend with that of all other clocks, mixed in a thin ethereal way with the clouds and wisps of smoke and died up there among the seagulls. Twelve o'clock struck as Clarissa Dalloway laid her green dress on her bed and a Warren Smiths walked on Harley Street. So Harley Street being this typical uh, medical street, that's where all the doctors in London reside. So it's popularly known as the medical street and the street where all the hospitals and doctors are. Uh, Twelve was the hour of their appointment. Probably, Rezzi had thought, that was Sir William Bradshaw's house with a grey motor car in front of it, the laden circles dissolved in the air. So again, look at the way in which different machines are represented in this novel, uh, signifiers of status, signifiers of velocity, signifiers of accomplishment. So, um, you know, this, this particular street, Harley Street is obviously a very uh, posh, welded neighbourhood in London and that's where, um, you know, uh, Dr. William Bradshaw's uh, house is and the appointment is in his house. Uh, and there's a car in front of his house and Rezia, uh, Lucretia Smith, uh, while walking down the house with, his, with her husband, the invalid Septimus Smith, uh, she looks at the car and assumes it is the, the doctor's car, which obviously goes on to show that the doctor's made quite a, a, lot of, a lot of money, a lot of wealth by treating his patients. Indeed it was, Sir so William Bradshaw's motor car, low, powerful, grey, with plain initials interlocked on the panel, as if the, as if the palms of heraldry were in Congress this man being the costly helper of the priest of science. And as the motor car was grey, so to match its sober solvity, grey furs, silver grey rocks were heaped in it to keep her ladyship warm while she waited. So again, look at the way in which the car is humanized, or rather effeminized. Uh, so the car is turned into a described or represented as a female. So her ladyship is waiting. Uh, Dr. William Bradshaw is uh, the male possessor of the car. Uh, and we are also told that, you know, uh, he is a priest of science. So again, um, science being this high pedestal of knowledge, the highest pedestal of knowledge because it involves proportion and logic and rationality. And you know, William Bradshaw embodies that that kind of wisdom uh, in common uh, in common vocabulary and common perspectives. So you know, he becomes the embodiment of hyper rationalist, masculinist uh, achiever, right? And, and the car obviously be becomes a signifier of that achievement, the professional social status that he that he enjoys as a doctor. 
Okay, for often, Sir William uh, we, we would travel 60 miles or more down in the country to visit the rich, the afflicted, who could afford a very large fee, which Sir William would probably charge, would very properly charge for his advice. Again, very mercenary quality board medicine is highlighted over here. So he would travel down 60 miles or more uh, to look at very rich patients. So he had a very niche clientele of patients. They would, they would be very happy to pay him a huge amount of money uh, because he would, be, he would give them exclusive service. Her ladyship waited with the rocks about her knees and our male leaning back, thinking about thinking sometimes of the patient, sometimes uh, exclusively of the wall of gold mounting minute by minute while she waited. The wall of gold that was mounting between them and all ships and anxieties. She had borne them bravely, they had had the struggle, until she felt wedged on a calm ocean where only spice winds blow, respected, admired envied, with scarcely anything left to wish for, though she regretted her stoutness, large dinner parties Thursday night to the profession, an occasional bazaar to be opened, royalty greeted, too little time, alas, with her husband, who was war grew and grew, a boy doing well at Eton, she would have liked a daughter too, interests she had, however, in plenty, child welfare, the aftercare of the epileptic, and photography, so that if there was a church building or a church decaying, she bribed the sexton, got the key and took photographs, which was scarcely uh, to be distinguished from the worker professionals while she waited. Now, again, look at the way in which the, suddenly we're talking about the, uh, the wife of uh, uh, William Bradshaw, from the car to the wife. So again, there's a very interesting blend of the human and the machine over here. And the car waiting also becomes an example of the human waiting, and we saw that happen in Elliot's Wasteland as well. Remember the taxi trubbing waiting uh, and as a rec rec recursive image in the Wasteland, while you know, human beings are becoming more and more machinic in quality. Now, this section, uh, it has a series of markers, uh, metonymy markers of class, uh, of uh, pro, you know, professional prestige, etc. And look at the way in which the division, the gender division happens over here very, very neatly. The husband goes and makes money, the wife does amateurist things. Uh, the wife is an amateur photographer, the wife is someone who takes care of different causes, etc. So this divide is very neatly uh, and you know, it's done in a very, very heavy handed, gendered way. And we are told that she's also an amateur photographer because whenever she hears that a church is decaying, she bribes the sexton, uh, gets in the church and takes photographs with the camera, uh, you know, which are supposedly just as good as professional photographs. Right, but then she has to wait all the time. So this whole idea of waiting becomes important. Waiting for her husband, waiting for a human communication, waiting for a human empathy, waiting for human warmth, which never obviously occurs, which never obviously emerges. So this endless wait for things which don't come is something which you see in uh, Mrs. Dalloway as well. Through this very micro character, so William Bradshaw's wife, uh, you know, is one of those characters who are obviously uh, endlessly waiting for the husband to exhibit some warmth, endlessly waiting for the life to exhibit some warmth around her. But then uh, uh, superficially and on the surface, everything is splendid for her. She's got a, uh, you know, a boy uh, who's doing well at Eton. She'll like a girl too, a daughter too. But then of course, they didn't have any other uh, ch children. So the only boy is in, is in Eton. Eton being obviously a signifier of privilege education, right? So all the markers of privilege are very carefully uh, strewn over here. <coughs> Okay, so, um, and then we have a, a categorization of Sir William Bradshaw. Um, Sir, William Brad, Sir William was himself was no longer young. He had worked very hard. He had won this position by sheer ability, being, the shong, being a son of a, of a shopkeeper, loved his profession, made a fine figurehead at ceremonies and spoke well, all of which had by the time he was knighted given him a heavy look, a wary look. The stream of patience being so incessant, the responsibilities and privileges of his profession so onerous which wariness, uh, together with his grey hairs, increased the extraordinary distinction of his presence and gave him the reputation of the utmost importance in dealing with nerve cases, of not merely lightning skill uh, and almost infallible accuracy in diagnosis, but of sympathy, tact, understanding of the human soul. He could see the first moment they came to the room, the Warren Smiths, they were called. He was certainly directly, he was certain directly he saw the man. It was a case of extreme gravity. It was a case of complete breakdown, a complete physical and nervous breakdown with every symptom in an advanced stage. He ascertained in two or three minutes, writing answers to questions, murmured discreetly on a pink card. So sympathy is something which is, uh, you know, ascribed to William Bradshaw, but of course there's this uh, degree of irony in it. And the other thing is there's no empathy at all. So there's a complete lack of empathy. He has, he has sympathy, which obviously is something which you exercise from a position of privilege. So he has lightning skill, his efficiency, his accuracy, and along with that he has sympathy. So he takes a look at uh, the Warren Smiths and immediately diagnoses a problem without even him having uh, opened up. 
Uh, how long has Dr. Holmes been attending him? Six weeks. Prescribed a little bromide, said there was nothing the matter. Oh, yes, those general practitioners, Dr. William. It took half his time to undo their blunders, some way irreparable. So, again, there's a conflict uh, and professional conflict over here. Uh, you know, they, they've come from here uh, from Dr. Holmes and now it's coming to Sir William Bradshaw. And uh, now, obviously, because he's a knighted uh, medical practitioner, that gives him a sense of privilege and superiority over the general practitioners, right? So, the general practitioners, such as Holmes, according to Dr. Uh, William Bradshaw, know nothing at all. Okay, uh, you serve with great distinction in the war. The patient repeated the, war, the word war interrogatively. He was attaching meanings to words of a symbolic kind, a serious symptom to be noted on the card. The war, the patient asks, the European war, the little shindy of schoolboys with gunpowder, had to serve with distinction. He really forgot. In the war itself, he had failed. So again, the war becomes the perfect uh, traumatic landscape for Septimus Smith in a sense that he f fails to remember anything post-war. So he forgets everything. The war absorbs his memory entirely. Yes, he served with the greatest distinction. Razi assured the doctor he was promoted. And they, they, they had the very highest opinion of you at the other office, Sir William murmured, glancing at Mr. Brewer's very generously worded letter, so that you have nothing to worry about, no financial anxiety, nothing. He had committed an appalling crime and had been condemned to death by human nature. I have, I have, he began, committed a crime. He's done nothing wrong whatsoever, Rezzi assured the doctor. If Mr. Smith would wait, said William, uh, Sir William, he would speak to Mrs. Smith in the next room. Her husband was very seriously ill, Sir William said. Did he threaten to kill himself? And again, obviously, this is the uh, quote unquote morbid uh, narcissism of Septimus, which is uh, a pathological syndrome, uh, symptom, according to these doctors. Uh, Septimus thinks he's committed a crime. Now, of course, we know that a crime that is committed is that uh, killed his feeling, thinking, sentient self. Right, because he's been trained to do it uh, through a series of rituals, through a series of uh, very manly drills, uh, military martial drills. Uh, that is a crime that is committed. It's killed his thinking, feeling self, his sentient self, his affective self, right? And that has been a crime, according to him, uh, an emotional crime. And of course, the, the doctor wants to speak with the, with the wife at the moment because he thinks that husband is quite mad. Uh, so he wants a separate word with her. Uh, and the obvious question is, did he threaten to kill himself? Oh, he did, he, she cried, but he did not mean it. She said, of course not. It was merely a question of rest. So, said Sir William, of rest, 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 a long rest in bed. Now, this is obviously uh, the uh, rest cure, which is uh, very, very uh, popular at that point in time. This is a, a method, a medical method, invented by someone called Silas Weir Michel, who was a doctor who made a fortune and fame out of the, out of the Civil War, the American Civil War. And he was the one who invented the rest cure method, where a patient would be confined to rest, almost coerced to take a rest. And there was a degree of violence in this rest cure method, in the sense that the, the, the patient would be taken away, would be bereft of all agency, right? And uh, a bit of a biographical uh, uh, digression over here, but you know, Virginia Woolf herself suffered the rest cure for a long time in her life. She was uh, made to sit in a, a confined room and was given a fixed diet every, every single day. So the rest cure becomes uh, not just a healing method, but a coercive method. It's an act of coercion where the, uh, the, the, the patient is forced to rest. There was a delightful home down in the country where her husband would be perfectly looked after. Away from her, she asks. Unfortunately, yes. The people we care for most are not good for us when we are ill. But he was not mad, was he? Sir William said he never spoke of madness. He called it not having a sense of proportion. But her husband did not like the doctors. He would refuse to go there. Shortly and kindly, Sir Williams explained to her the state of the case. He had threatened to kill himself. There was no alternative. It was a question of law. He would lie in bed in a beautiful house in the country. The nurses were admirable. Sir William would visit him once a week. And Mrs. Warren Smith was quite sure. She had no more questions to ask. He never hurried his patients. They would return to her husband. She had nothing more to ask. Not a Sir William. So look at the, uh, this, this passage is loaded, it's couched with irony. Uh, first of all, uh, we, we see this whole idea of Sir Williams uh, having this whole idea of rest, rest, rest. The reputation of the word rest, uh, it immediately implies a coercive, violent quality about this particular medical method. Uh, and then, of course, the whole idea of being away from your loved ones. So, you know, Septimus is supposed to be away from, your, uh, from, a, from, a, from, a, from his wife. Uh, and the doctor's prescription is uh, nearness to the people he's emotionally attached to is bad for him at this point in time. Why so? Because, you know, this is a simple case of a loss of a sense of proportion. So everything is very proportion-centric to Dr. Holmes uh, and William Bradshaw over here. Everything must be put down into proportion. Everything must be boxed. Everything must be quantified and quantifiable. Everything must have a shape and a structure. Okay. 
Uh, and obviously, um, the next thing which is important for us is to know that because Septimus had threatened to kill himself, this becomes not just a medical problem but a legal problem. Uh, so we, again, we have this very interesting collusion between law and medicine where the person's agency, you know, the patient's agency is completely disregarded uh, and then what is uh, given is an, is an entire template, a tyrannical template of confinement and, and coercion, which is what Septimus is about to be uh, about to suffer at this point of time. Uh, and of course, uh, William Bradshaw uh, asked uh, Mrs. Warren Smith uh, if there's any more question and uh, there is an irony in here. He never hurried his patients. So again, this obviously carries irony because he's trying to wind up over here. They would not return to a husband. They would return to a husband. She had nothing more to ask, not a Sir William. So again, look at the diagnosis at play over here. He doesn't even talk to the patient. He takes some secondhand information from the patient's spouse and decides the method of cure for Septimus. So it's a complete disconnect from the experiential reality that Septimus is facing, the experiential suffering of Septimus, uh, this complete disconnect and disregard uh, for that experientiality of Septimus. And this is what we have for Sir William uh, Bradshaw is a series of template and see in which template does Septimus fit into. And the rescue method, the rest, rest, rest method is a template that Septimus is uh, supposedly uh, about to fit into according to Sir William Bradshaw. So this according to being uh, the very important uh, bit. Okay, so. Um, uh, so again, uh, he, he recommends one country home uh, for Septimus's betterment. Um, one of my homes, Mr. Warren Smith, he said, where we will teach you to rest. So again, look at the way in which this is very, very complex because on the one hand, purely commercially speaking, what he's doing is he's making some more money out of Septimus. He's forcing him to go to a home uh, in a guest house which is actually owned by him. Right, or even attached to him at some level, medically speaking. So obviously, Septimus staying there uh, would, uh, you know, make it payable for uh, Sir, Sir uh, uh, Williams. Uh, and the other part is uh, equally interesting, perhaps more, uh, you know, dark and sinister. He told that Septimus has told that uh, Holmes, uh, you know, uh, William Bradshaw, sorry, and his team of doctors will teach him to rest. So where we will teach you to rest. So this whole idea of teaching someone to rest it carries a coercive quality in it by default. It carries this tyrannical quality, this violent quality in it by default. Uh, there was just one more thing, or one thing more. He was quite certain that when Miss, Mrs. Warren Smith was well, he was the last man in the world to frighten his wife. But he did talk of killing himself. We all have moments of depression, says Sir William. Once you fall, Septimus repeated to himself, human nature is on you. Holmes and Bradshaw are on you. The scow on the desert, the flies screaming into the wilderness, the rack and a thumb screw are applied human nature is remorseless, right? So again, it's mercilessness, remorselessness of human nature, something which Septimus is experiencing over here. And the fall is important because fall carries the different connotations, the biblical connotations, the biological connotations, of course, the medical and existential connotations. Septimus has fallen in his own eyes as a human being because he cannot feel anymore. He's been traumatized by the war. He's consumed so much trauma in the war that he cannot possibly uh, come out of it now. Uh, so obviously, once you fall, human nature preys on you. Uh, Holmes and Bradshaw prey on you. They become the predators preying on you. Uh, and you become uh, a, a small bird trying to fly away from their uh, pursuit. The scow that is uh, the fly screaming into the wilderness, the rack and the thumb screw are applied. Human nature is remorseless. So the rack again is an example of medieval torture instrument and the thumb screw obviously is an instrument to tie a body to the rack. And we saw this rack example, this rack image, in even in Eliot's early poetry, right, where the, it becomes the instrument of torture, a space of torture. And see, notice over here how medical science and the practitioners of medical science, far from being healing figures, they actually become torturing figures, they become coercive figures. These are figures who mercilessly attack you, the, the suffering man. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, he gives more man talk and he gives more man spin to Septimus, where he says he have a brilliant career uh, before you, says Sir William. There was Mr. Brewer's letter on the table, an exceptionally brilliant career. So again, look at the way in which the different connections, the different narratives are made. Mr. Brewer, who belongs to another narrative, enters this particular narrative to a letter on the table of uh, Sir William when he's talking to Septimus Smith and Razia Street, right? Uh, Razia Smith. So all these different uh, markers of connect are important. A little letter over here, uh, you know, uh, the, the Big Ben banging away, obviously, and connecting every little space-time into one standardized uh, display and, and, and sound of time. Okay. Um, and then, of course, the whole idea of crime comes up. Uh, he tries to remember what crime he had committed, but he couldn't remember it because, of course, he hadn't committed any crime, but he's just fallen in his own eyes as a sentient 
feeling so. But what was his crime? He could not remember it. Yes, said uh, Sir Williams and Carishton, but it was growing late. Love, trees, there was no crime. What was his message? He could not remember it. I, I, Septimus stammered. Try to think as little about yourself as possible, said Sir William kindly. Really, he was not fit to be about. Right, so again, this whole idea of morbid introspection or morbid, uh, you know, self-reflection is something which is discouraged by the doctors over here because that is accordingly, according to the doctors, according to the standards of medical science, that will further, uh, that, that will worsen uh, and, and aggravate the situation that is already in. Okay, was there anything else they wished to ask him? Sir William would make all arrangements. He murmured to Razia and he would let him know, but at 5 and 6 that evening he murmured. So he would make all the arrangements. And obviously, you can see the collusion between tourism, a rescue, and medicine over here. He will send Septimus to one of his own homes, where presumably he will have to pay uh, for that very, very wealthy and privileged living. Okay, trust everything to me, he said, and dismiss them. Never, never had Rezia felt such agony, felt such agony in her life. She had asked for help and had been deserted. She had failed, he had failed them. Sir William Bradshaw was not a nice man. So this is the perception Rezia has about the doctor. He's not a nice man. Okay. So, um, and then of course we have uh, William Bradshaw's uh, and a whole idea of proportion, and this should be on the screen. Um, Proportion, divine proportion, Sir Williams' goddess, was acquired by Sir Williams walking hospitals, catching Salmon, begetting one son in Holly Street by Lady Bradshaw, who, who caught Salmon herself and took photo photographs sick, scarcely to be distinguished from the vocal professionals. So again, the whole idea of proportion becomes one of, uh, it's a divine design and everyone's aiming for proportion to give them shape and meaning to their lives. Worship in proportion, Sir Williams could not only prospered himself but made England prosper, secluded the Hellenatics, forbade childhood, uh, childbirth, sorry, penalized despair, uh, made it uh, impossible for the unfit to propagate the views until they too share his sense of proportion. His, uh, if they were men, Lady Bradshaw's, if they were women, she embroidered, knitted, spent four nights out of a seven at home with a son. So not only did his colleagues respect him, his subordinates fear him, but his friends and relations of his patients felt for him the keenest gratitude for insisting that this prophetic Christ uh, and Christ who, who prophesies at the end of the world or the advent of God should drink milk in bed as Sir Williams ordered. Right, so the whole idea of proportion becomes interesting and this becomes a very dominant narrative at this point, point of time. And again, look at the way in which agenda activities are mapped out quite clearly. So Lady Bradshaw will be embroidering, knitting and, you know, uh, spending time with the son, whereas, uh, you know, Sir William Bradshaw uh, would be curing people and, you know, using a very, very proportion-centric medical gaze. This very hyper-rationalist proportion-centric medical gaze. Okay. Sir William, with his 30 years of experience of all these kinds of causes and his infallible instinct, this is madness in this sense, in fact, his sense of proportion. Right. So again, proportion comes back. The proportion has a sister, less smiling, more formidable, a goddess even now engaged in the, in the heat and sands of India, the modern swamp of Africa, the Pirellis of uh, Polis of London, and whatever in short the climate of the devil tempts men to fall down from the true belief which is their own, he is even now engaged in dashing down, uh, down shrines, smashing idols and setting up in the place her own stern countenance. Right? So again, the, uh, the whole idea of proportions. Uh, Sister is mentioned again. These are humanized. These are again pathetic fallacies. Conversion is a name, and she feeds on the wills of the weakly, loving to impress, to impose, adoring her own features, stamped on the face of the populace. At Hyde Park corner, on the top, she stands preaching, shrouds herself in white, and walks in a penitentially uh, distinguished as brotherly love through factories and parliaments, offers help. Uh, offers help but desires power, smites out of her way roughly the dis dis dissentient or dissatisfied, bestows a blessing on those who are looking upward, catch submissively from her eyes the light of their own. This lady too, Razia Warrensman divined it, had a wedding in Sir William's heart, though concealed, as she mostly is, under some plausible disguise, some venerable name, love, duty, uh, self-sacrifice, right? So the whole idea of uh, conversion becomes conversion becomes the wife, the, the sister of preparation. But we see how conversion too is very, very coercive in quality. Okay, it's very, very uh, you know, dissident in quality. But then it's trying to put people together. It's trying to give uh, a shape and a, 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 a name to the different human experiences. And it's this constant obsession with conversion and proportion that, uh, that uh, Dr. Uh, Holmes and Bradshaw exhibit is just completely the ontological opposite and the anathema to the very fluid experience of Septimus. And that's why the incompatibility between Septimus, the sufferer, and Holmes and Bradshaw, the supposed uh, doctors that are suffering. 
Okay. So we find that the two doctors presented in this novel are very interesting characters. They obviously are symptoms, uh, they are embodiments of the extensions of medical masculinity which uh, is completely inadequate in terms of looking at um, the, the shell shock soldiers because still relying on preparation, logic, rationality and this very quantifiable and empirical uh, evidence uh, which is used for medical practices. But obviously with shell shock and PTSD and trauma, war trauma, there is no real physical damage done to the sufferer or the subject. Instead what we have uh, is a mental damage and emotional damage and that needs to be addressed which does not get addressed at all uh, by either of the two characters in the novel. So, I will stop at this point today but this lecture we looked at the different kinds of medical masculinities which are promoted, produced and projected uh, in this particular section. Obviously, as a critique to that kind of masculinity because remember uh, Wolf is writing this novel as a critique uh, of medical masculinity, it is hyper rationalist, proportional loving medical masculinity which is something which is completely opposite and anathema uh, to the idea of art, to the idea of experience, to the idea of affectivity right. So, affect becomes something that is hold, that's held on to uh, and Septimus of course, his biggest br brutality, his biggest causality is his loss of effect and the, the fact that he's lost all his emotions and cannot connect to any emotion around him at all. And then of course, he's at the hands of this merciless medical doctors who are relying on preparations, who have this over reliance on preparation and who essentially confine him and coerce him into taking rest. Uh, you know rest, rest, rest. So, rest becomes a, you know a medical method which is becomes which almost becomes very quickly a coercive method that Septimus is subjected to as a war veteran, as a war trauma survivor right. So, I stop at this point today and hopefully by the next lecture we should be able to wind up with this essay with this particular book Mrs. Stalloway. I thank you for your attention.